I think you know this is the last day of the festival, and we hope to leave you with a few more memorable moments. We're going to begin this moment this morning with Shakespeare, fitting because we've sp spent the last few days in Sydney Harmon Hall, home of the Shakespeare Theatre Company. And we are delighted to welcome the theater's brand new artistic director, Simon Godwin, who's just come to Washington from London's Royal National Theatre. He's actually making a kind of debut here with us and is here to grapple with some big, vexing questions. Who was Shakespeare? And how do we bring his work to life today? Take it away, Simon Godwin. Ah. Well, uh, good morning, um, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to speak today as part of the Atlantic Festival. Um, in her recent article for The Atlantic, Elizabeth Winkler argues that Shakespeare may in fact have been a woman, the Renaissance poet and musician Amelia Lanier. Winkler's feminine stance is compelling. Certainly, Shakespeare's heroines impress us today by railing against the patriarchy and defying double standards and move us by their deeply felt female friendships. Women in Shakespeare overturn, provoke, taunt, exhilarate, and speak truth to power. Miss Wiggler's search for a feminine voice is captivating. My focus as a director, however, is less with the author's identity and more with the rich and fluid identity of the plays themselves. My job is to ask how the works of this Shakespeare, whoever they were, writing 400 years ago, can speak to diverse audiences today. I'm interested not in who they were as much as how their plays can shed light on who we are in the moment of now. By thinking creatively and collaboratively, Shakespeare's infinite varieties can emerge through bold choices in the present day. Now, let me share with you some examples, if I may, about my own directing experience of Shakespeare. Casting the actress uh, Tamsin Gregg in a role only played by men for 400 years came with its own challenges. But rather, the, but rather acknowledging rather than obscuring her gender opened up some thrilling new possibilities. In Twelfth Night at the National Theatre that I directed, Malvoli O became Malvoli A. His became hers, Lord became lady. And in this festive comedy about desire and love, why shouldn't a puritanical, judgmental steward harbor a secret attraction for her beautiful boss? Something newly alive, both comic and tragic, suddenly emerged about Malvolia's plight, a repressed character at war with her own inner desires. The troubling scenes of Malvolia's outing took on a new poignancy, and when Malvolia sheds her old identity in the final act, the play achieved a new power. My acknowledging and celebrating the regendering of the performer rather than the writer, a popular but old-fashioned old -fashioned play became a bruising but uplifting story of identity and transgression. Before 2010, there were only one or two major productions a year of a more obscure and difficult Shakespeare play, Timon of Athens. A rich man gives generously to his friends. When his wealth dwindles and bankruptcy beckons, he asks the same friends for help. They refuse. He dies bitter and alone from a broken heart. After the financial crisis and global recession of 2009, the play has only grown in popularity. <laughs> you can see why. But it's a play about the masculine institutions of patriarchy, patronage, and the military. But in a contemporary setting, facing audiences now, the almost exclusively male cast and textual misogyny of the original simply didn't add up. Catherine Hunter, uh, a shape-shifting actress who has tackled several of Shakespeare's kingly roles, became in my production for the Royal Shakespeare Company, Time of Athens. Her performance brought a generosity of spirit that this story needed, while cuts to the text addressed the problematic treatment of women. Catherine made us realize why this forgotten Shakespeare play was a zeitgeist work, a reversed fairy tale for our own economic times. Clearing away the misogynistic baggage helped release the play, allowing it to speak with a new urgency. The essential playing cards were the same, but reshuffled for a modern set of players. In so many ways, the politics of Hamlet 
can seem far away in a modern Western production, with warring kings or regicide, ghosts, and so on. Moreover, the Royal Shakespeare Company had never invited an actor of color to play the Prince of Denmark. Wasn't this the right time to bring a fresh approach? How could I make a Hamlet that reflected the experiences of diverse contemporary British audiences? When I met the young unknown actor Papa Eseju, he spoke about his dual experience of having a Ghanaian heritage while growing up in London, of traveling between two distinct continents. Rather than the cliched world of Danish castles, Hamlet's homeland became a setting rife with political turmoil, deeply held religious beliefs, and a profound sense of familial obligation. Contemporary West Africa. I traveled to Ghana and was amazed by the resonances with the text. I met artists, academic, dancers, priests, shaman, and began to see the play through new eyes. But I also thought about my own London, uh, the fierce prose of Zadie Smith, and indeed the vibrant colors of the African-American artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. That fusion of black British, African-American, and Afro-Caribbean culture all went into the revelatory Elsinore we created, led by Papa's own experiences and those of the incredible Afro-Caribbean cast we assembled. Hamlet received an extraordinary new life, playing not only in the center of Hackney in East London to vast young audiences, but even reaching the Kennedy Center here in Washington, D.C. By actually collaborating with diverse viewpoints, the text achieved a radical new visual identity. While its core themes of family, power, destiny, and free will were reinvigorated for now. In her article, Miss Winkler makes a truly exciting case for why we want a female Shakespeare. However, deep down, I hope we never manage to resolve the question of who Shakespeare truly was. The greatest gift Shakespeare gives us was his or her invisibility. They understood that the most creative gift of all is space. Space to dream, space to imagine myriad possibilities and worlds, space to live beyond categorical definitions of gender. In the plays of Shakespeare, violent monarchs live side to side with truth-speaking daughters. Despondent princes are taught life lessons by gravediggers. A young immigrant girl rescued from a shipwreck brings a healing love to her newfound land. Shakespeare reminds us that being a human being involves holding inside us many competing feelings, voices, and identities. Through the casting, directorial, and editorial choices that I've described, Shakespeare continues to morph and evolve. 400 years on, he's still the most widely performed and admired artist the world has ever known. Why? Because he provokes rather than resolves. Questions rather than answers. Who's there? Let's hope we never find out. <laughs> Thank you very much.